Is it worth it? This text really struck a chord with me this week. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but the year 2020 has been a bit of a challenge so far. Anybody else aware of that fact? Bit of a challenge. Difficulty, opposition, frustration, wondering what's happening, wondering what God's doing, experiencing that kind of frustration in your life. I know as pastors and as church leaders, it's been difficult. As we sit around the table trying to figure out how we're going to do ministry, how we're going to walk through these things, how we're going to do church, how we're going to gather, not gather, small groups, children's ministry. Just to speak in a very transparent way with you this morning, I found myself asking that question, is this really worth it? God, what are you doing right now? I think I kind of shocked our staff because I said that out loud one time in a staff meeting. And we talked about it and prayed about it. But those are the things that we ask. Those are the questions that we ask. Those are the struggles of our hearts. And I want you to know that as your pastor, I've got the same struggles that you have. And you just wonder sometimes, man, this is just tough. I don't know what God's doing. Is this really worth it? I don't think I'm the first Christian leader to ask those questions. I have a feeling that if you were to talk to Paul and Barnabas, the greatest missionaries who ever lived on this planet, I bet if you talked to Paul and Barnabas that there were times in their ministry that they asked the question, what in the world are we doing? What have we gotten ourselves into? Is all of this opposition, is all of this persecution, all of these things that we're going through, is this all really worth it or not? And at the end of the day, I think they answered yes. Yes, it's absolutely worth it. We're going to see Paul and Barnabas getting sent out by their home church, the church of Antioch. We're going to see something in this text like what you saw from our friends who talked a moment ago as they have been sent out by us for field work. And they come back to report We're going to watch that whole cycle in Acts chapter 13 and 14. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 13 and 14 today. We're going to see a church that prepares, a church that sends out missionaries. We're going to see missionaries that go and they preach, they proclaim the word. We're going to see them persecuted. We're going to see them in difficult positions, probably asking themselves the question, is this worth it? But at the end of the day, the answer is going to be yes, it's worth it. And I want you to trace this cycle through these two chapters today. Because by the end of chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas come back to the church that sent them out and they report to their home church. And I have to imagine what that report was like. That was 2,000 years ago. They didn't have fancy technology like videos. I'm sure that when they came back to Antioch, they probably used a slide projector. You remember those days? Missionary comes, (laughs) slides on the screen. This is where we were. This is our town. And I can just imagine Paul and Barnabas, the lights go down in the auditorium, slides. Here's our trip to Cyprus. Here's the crazy demon-possessed sorcerer that we met as we traveled to the next town. And this, you're not going to believe what happened. They thought we were gods. I mean, how crazy are they, right? None of you have ever mistaked us for gods before. Oh, and then the apostle Paul was stoned to death in the picture of Barnabas weeping over his body and the next picture of Paul miraculously coming back to life and then the final picture of the slide presentation of Paul and Barnabas on the boat the mountains in the background the beautiful sunset as they're coming back home to report all the things that happened on their missionary journey that's the context of Acts 13 and 14 today is it worth it In order to answer that question, is it worth it, we have to watch the cycle of what happens because that's not always easy. We prepare, we proclaim, we are persecuted. But at the end of the day, what makes it worth it? That's what we're going to see in these stories as they're threaded together for us by Luke, the author of this text. As we go through the sermon, we're just going to really have one slide up. It's a map. I want you to see the map as it goes through the missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas. 
You can see they started in Antioch over there to the right of the screen. They went down to Cyprus. They moved up to southern Galatia, up to another Antioch, down through Iconium and Lystra, Derby, and they retraced their steps exactly the way they came and back to Antioch. That's the path the text tech takes us through. It's not very complicated, but it's good to visualize so that you get an idea of what this missionary journey looks like. And so the first step in this cycle that we see is preparation. And there was great preparation that went into Paul and Barnabas being sent out by the church. Look in your Bibles at Acts chapter 13, verse 1. It says, Now in the church of Antioch there were prophets and teachers, and Antioch is now the center of missionary activity. The focus has moved from the church in Jerusalem to the church of Antioch. And fast forward 350 years, and we see that Antioch is really the center of Christianity in about 400 A.D., they estimate there was maybe 100,000 Christians in the city of Antioch. It really took over. It took the mantle of Christianity, and now they are sending people out. Up until this point, any time the church sent people out, it was to check up on evangelism, and now the church of Antioch is sending people out to do evangelism, to go and reach people for Christ. That's what we read about in these verses. It says there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, and we're going to see that there was great diversity in this church, and I think the diversity led to them wanting to send people out to reach other nations with the gospel. And Barnabas was from Cyprus himself. Simeon, or Simon, who is called Niger, and the word Niger means dark complected, and many people believe that this actually could be Simon of Cyrene, the man who carried our Lord's cross on the road to his crucifixion. Serving, praying, teaching, part of this local church. There was Lucius of Cyrene, and there was Menaean, who was a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch. And Herod the Tetrarch is the one who had John the Baptist beheaded. And so we have what we believe is a childhood friend of Herod, a man who grew up in the court, who's now trusted and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and is part of this church. Great diversity in this local church. And as they're praying and fasting together, verse 2, look what happens. They were worshiping the Lord and fasting, and the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them to. What is this work that God's called them to? Well, so fascinating to me as you trace through the book of Acts that it's very clear that God is sovereign over all things, that God is the one really doing the work in the hearts of people, yet for some strange reason, God places his mission to evangelize the world in the hands of humans. And we have throughout this whole book, and especially Acts 13 and 14, this great tension between God's sovereignty on one hand and our activities as humans on the other hand. And how those two work together, I will never know this side of heaven. But we have it presented here in the text. And God is setting Paul and Barnabas apart for this work. What work? To fulfill the mission the great commission of going to all nations and preaching the gospel, seeing people come to faith in Christ and baptizing them and planting local churches. And if we're not careful, we read that and we think that it's us doing the work, but that is not what's happening. We're going to see that in these chapters. It's not us doing the work. God is the one who's at work. And so they set sail. They lay hands on them and they set sail. The first place they go is to Cyprus. Look with me at verse 4. They go to Cyprus to begin with, and we watch this cycle beginning to play out. It's going to play out in each of these stories. So there's been preparation by this church in Antioch. They've prepared. They've prayed. They're ready. And I think this church continued to pray, the preparation and prayer to send these men out. And then they go and they proclaim the Word of God. Look what it says in verse 4. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Arriving in Salamis, they proclaim the word of God to the Jewish synagogues. That's the first thing I always do. They go, they, they prepare, so we prepare. Next, we proclaim. What happens after they proclaim? It says in verse 6, when they had traveled the whole island as far as Paphos, they came across a sorcerer, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. Interestingly, this false prophet, this pagan, this satanically influenced man, he bore the name of Jesus. His name is literally Son of the Savior. Paul's going to grab a hold of that here in a few verses and do something different with that. Verse 7, he was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. And so this pagan, this demon-possessed man, was an advisor to the city leader, the proconsul. 
an intelligent man. And this man, this proconsul, summoned Barnabas and Saul and wanted to hear the word of God. So they began to preach. They're proclaiming again to the leader of the city. And this other man, this sorcerer, begins to oppose them. Verse 8, but Elymas the sorcerer opposed them and turned the proconsul away from the faith. So what's the cycle that we see? We prepare, we proclaim, and then we are persecuted or opposed. We're feeling the opposition. Man, a lot of us are in that, in that place right now, aren't we? A lot of us are certainly feeling the opposition of the enemy right now, trying to work against what God is doing. We're feeling that in our culture. And the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, they felt that at every turn, everywhere they went. This cycle repeated itself. They proclaimed they were persecuted. But look what happens. Verse 9, but Saul, who is called Paul, this is the first time his name is changed, filled with the Holy Spirit, stared straight at Elymas. This is fascinating here. Bold from the Apostle Paul. Stared straight at him and said, you are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery, you son of the devil. (laughs) Wow. Kids, don't go home and call anybody that, okay? I know it's in the Bible, but Paul had a reason for calling him this. And he says, you enemy of all that is right. Won't you ever stop perverting the straight paths of the Lord? Now look, the Lord's hand is against you. You're going to be blind. You will not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and darkness fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. So Paul calls down blindness on this man. What's the result? Verse 12, then when the proconsul saw what happened, he believed because he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So here's the pattern developing. We prepare, we proclaim, we are persecuted or opposed, but God is working. Isn't that great? God is working. And so amidst that, Paul and Barnabas come upon this sorcerer, and he tries to oppose what they're doing, and Paul calls him out, and God works through it, and this man comes to faith in Christ. I love to see Paul's boldness here. I think more and more in our culture, we're going to feel that kind of pressure as well. We're going to feel the opposition to the gospel. I don't know if you've noticed, but it seems that our Christian, our our nation is becoming less and less welcoming to Christianity. Anybody else noticing that? There seems to be a cultural pressure against Christianity. There is a time and a place to stand up for the truth. And you look at what Paul did here and you think, well, man, that wasn't a very good testimony. I mean, Paul's talking to an unbeliever. Why didn't he speak grace and truth to this unbeliever? But you see, sometimes there is a point in time where we must call it out. We must call out even unbelievers for their opposition to the gospel. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul did here. This man who was coming up against the gospel, teaching doctrines of demons, and he called him out. He called him, you son of the devil and worker of all that is against God. And the result of that was that somebody believed. Somebody heard what happened and trusted we prepare, we proclaim, we are persecuted, but God is working. So why did the Apostle Paul at the end of the day say it's worth it? It's worth it because in all of this, in the struggle, what's happening? God is working. I promise you, God is working. And I'm saying that as much for my own heart as I am saying that for your benefit here this morning as well. And so they move on. Verse 13, they go to Antioch of Pisidia. There's a lot of Antiochs. You're seeing that in the book of Acts. So they move up north to Antioch. And we have Paul's first sermon here that's actually recorded for us. And they go, and it says, Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia, but John left them and went back to Jerusalem. We're going to read more about John Mark's desertion later in another chapter. Verse 14, they continued their journey from Perga and reached the Pisidian of Antioch. On the Sabbath day, they went to the synagogue and sat down. After reading the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, you can speak. So if you were in a synagogue in that day and a traveling rabbi came, somebody who knew the word, and they sat down, it was a custom to invite them to give a guest sermon. Little did the leader of the synagogue know what he was getting himself into as he just asked the Apostle Paul to give a guest sermon in the synagogue. So Paul, never being the shy type, is invited to preach. He takes the opportunity, 
and he begins to preach in verse 16. I'm not going to read all of this sermon, but essentially these verses 16 through 23, he goes through the history of Israel and shows how God worked through different people. Verses 23 through 25, it culminates in the Lord Jesus Christ. He preaches Jesus to them and affirms it by the ministry of John the Baptist. Look at verse 24 in your Bibles. It says, before Jesus coming to public attention, John had previously proclaimed a baptism of repentance. And what we learn from this verse is that the ministry of John was actually well known. And so here Paul is using John as a reference. You know that, that baptizer guy you heard about down in Jerusalem? Everybody seemed to respect him. Yeah, that John, he talked about someone else coming. And I'm here to tell you today that other person coming is Jesus. And he already came. And let me tell you what happened to him. Now he goes on in verses 26 and following and says that the Jewish leaders, they convicted him through Pilate. They put him on a cross. They crucified him. But verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. And he appeared for many days to those who came up from Galilee to Jerusalem who are now his witnesses to the people. And so Paul proclaims the Lord Jesus Christ, his death for our sins, his resurrection to give us salvation, and then goes on and ties the resurrection to Old Testament prophecy given to David in verse 34. He says, God told David that one of his descendants wouldn't see decay, that he would come out of a tomb. And I'm here to tell you today that that person is Jesus. He lived, he was crucified, he died, put in a tomb and rose from the dead. That's the one that was promised to David. And he preaches the gospel to these people in this text. And then wraps it up in verse 39. You can hear the piano start to play just as I am here, right? Opens up the invitation. Verse 39, everyone who believes is justified through him from everything that you cannot be justified from through the law of Moses. In other words, you keep trying to be righteous on your own through the law and it's futile. Jesus finished it for you. Believe! And if you don't believe, then you're going to miss your chance. And he goes on and he quotes some Old Testament form in verse 41. It says, don't be like the ones in the Old Testament. Don't miss your chance. And he speaks pretty, pretty clear to these people. He's not mincing any words. Now you wonder what the response was. Man, this guy's nuts. Get out of our synagogue. We don't ever want you back. What's the response? Verse 42, as they were leaving, the people urged them to speak about these matters the following Sabbath. Man, this is every preacher's dream. You come into a church, you preach, and they say, we want to hear you again next week. Sure, sounds good. So what they do? They only hung around the town for a while. It says, verse 43, after the synagogue had been dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas who were speaking with them, urging them to continue in the grace of God. They talked to people all week about Jesus. The next Sunday, or sorry, Saturday, not Sunday. Next Saturday, next Sabbath day rolls around. <laughs> And everybody's gathering, and they got the greeters out at the front doors, and they got the coffee going and the donuts, and they're expecting their normal crowd, which is pretty small. Verse 44, the following Sabbath, how many people came? Almost the whole town assembled to hear the word of the Lord. How's this going to make the local pastor feel of the synagogue? He labors there, the rabbis labor there every Saturday, every Sabbath day. They get this small group of people, and suddenly this Paul guy comes from out of town. He preaches a sermon, and the whole town shows up the next week to hear him preach. Kind of reminds me of parenting. You tell your kids something a million times, right? And then they go to school, and they come home, and they're like, Hey, you know what my teacher just said? I've told you this a thousand times. Or one time, I remember I heard this song, and I'm like, I, I think my dad would really like this song. I played it for my dad, and he's like, Huh? About a year later, he comes to me, Mike, you got to hear this song. Guess what he does? plays the same song I played for him a year ago. Yeah, it's so frustrating. God always has a great sense of humor with me. God likes to humble me a lot, as he does all of us, right? It seems like whenever I'm gone on vacation, that's when God brings all the visitors to church. <laughs> it's like, Mike, I just want you to know that I can do this church thing without you. And I hear back from when I'm gone, like, man, we had great attendance the Sunday Jared preached. Jared! God's just like, eh, I got this under control. Look what happens in the text. This is classic. Verse 45. When the Jews saw the crowds, man, they don't come out when I preach like that. They were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what Paul was saying, insulting him. And Paul is stepping in a hornet's nest here because we're going to see that these Jews he ticked off, they're, they're going to start following him around. They're going to start coming every town that he's in, trying to poison the, the listeners, try to oppose his message. So we see this, 
pattern starting to emerge from the text. We prepare, which is good. Pray, lay hands on people, send them out. We prepare. We proclaim the word. And guess what we can expect? We are persecuted. We are opposed. But the good news, my friend, is that God is working. Look what it says in the text. Verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and honored the word of the Lord, and all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the entire region, but the Jews incited the prominent God-fearing women and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the district. But Paul and Barnabas shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. I'm glad we don't do that practice today. You get upset at someone, you take a flip-flop off and shake the dust out at them. Oh, get you... I'm going to try that to somebody this week. It might be kind of fun. Verse 52. Look at the result. And the disciples were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. Isn't that fantastic? We prepare. We proclaim. We are persecuted. But friend, how do you know that it's worth it? Why do we know it's worth it? It's God's working. God's working. God's doing His thing. And it's no more clear than it is in verse 48. And I love the verse 48's tucked in here in this text. Just this little verse here in the middle of the book of Acts. Probably one of the most significant verses in all the New Testament. Verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, what happens? There's an audience of people listening to the Word, listening to the Gospel being preached. Some of them are going to respond and receive Christ as their Savior. Not all of them. Which ones are the ones who respond? All who had been appointed to eternal life believed. I could preach four more sermons just on this verse. You know, you say, oh, Pastor Mike, what does that word mean in the Greek? Well, let me tell you what it means in the Greek. Appointed, elected, chosen, you name it. It is what it is here in the text. And I love how God just drops this in here because there's this great combination between divine sovereignty and human freedom, but design, d- divine sovereignty and human effort as well because Paul and Barnabas were sent out by this church to do the work that God had appointed for them. And they are working, they're preaching, they're coming, they're meeting people, they're sharing the gospel with people. But at the end of the day, who's doing the work? God's doing the work. And that, that, that is so comforting to me. That's so comforting to know that it doesn't rest on my shoulders, that I'm not responsible for the results. So comforting for me to know that I need to be faithful to the Word to do what God told me to do, but He's the one who's in control, that He's doing it. And, and sometimes you think to yourself, man, this is hard to understand. Would, would God really do something like this and have it seem like a contradiction? Why can't we understand that? The Bible tells us we're not supposed to understand the mind of God. God works on a different level than we do. We're just supposed to trust Him, know that He's in control, but at the same time, He asks us to be faithful to preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Win people to Christ. Proclaim the word. You're going to feel opposition. You're going to come up against opposition, but God is at work. God is busy saving people. And to that I say, hallelujah. And that makes it worth it. I heard an illustration of this one time. This is really a, a nice illustration of how this works. And if you were to think of it like this, salvation is like a garden. And on the way into the garden, there's a gate. And on the gate, there's a sign. And on that sign, it says, whosoever will may come. And you walk through the gate of salvation. You enjoy the beauty of the garden. You enjoy the joy of salvation. You look back at that gate and the sign, the reverse of that sign, the back of that sign, the sign that said, whoever whoever will may come, back of that sign says, chosen before the foundation of the world. How does that work? I'm not sure, but I like the fact that that tension's in the text because it gives me hope It helps me to know that, yes, it is worth it, that God's told us to work, that God's promised us there's going to be opposition, that He's promised us it's not going to be easy, but in the midst of it all, God is working. Let's move on to chapter 14. We see them come to this place called Iconium, and it's the same pattern in Iconium. In Iconium, they entered the Jewish synagogue as usual. I like how Luke throws that in, as usual. This is Paul's pattern. Go to the synagogue. Preach to people that knew about the Scriptures. Once they reject, go to the Gentiles. Always bring a ministry partner. We see his methodology of being a missionary. 
Verse 2, but unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their mind. The same guys that came uh, from, from Antioch, they followed him down there. Wherever Paul went, he had the guys in the black top hats following him, causing him problems. So they stayed there for a long time and spoke boldly for the Lord who testified to the message of his grace, enabling them to do signs and wonders. But the people of the city were divided, some siding with the Jews and others with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Jews and Gentiles and their rulers to mistreat and stone them, they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian towns of Lystra and Derbe to the surrounding countryside. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Man, they worked hard there in Iconium but didn't seem to have any results. Oh, but wait. Look over at verse 21 of chapter 14. They retrace their steps. They go back to Iconium. And what does it say? After they had preached the gospel in that town, they made many disciples. They returned to Lystra, Iconium, and to Antioch, strengthening the disciples. So there were disciples made. They proclaimed. They were persecuted. But God was working. Now we move on to Lystra. And the time, the ministry in Lystra was very interesting. If you look with me in verse 8, we have the same pattern emerging again. We prepare. They were sent out by Antioch. We proclaim. So here they are proclaiming the word. In Lystra, a man was sitting who was without strength in his feet and never walked and, Paul, or, and had been laid from birth, rather. He listened as Paul spoke. After looking directly at him and seeing his faith to be healed, Paul said in a loud voice, Stand up on your feet. And he jumped up and began to walk around. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted, saying in, in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And I think it took Paul and Barnabas a second to figure out what was going on because they were speaking a language they didn't understand. And suddenly the priests of Zeus, verse 13, whose temple was just outside the town, brought bulls and wreaths and gates, and they were going to sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas. And suddenly Paul and Barnabas were like, Whoa, there, stop. We can't do this. We're men just like you, verse 14. Why are you doing these things? We are people just like you, and we are proclaiming the good news to you that you turn from worthless things to the living God. Verse 19, things are going well. Until the Jews come, following them to the next city. Verse 19, some of the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and they won over the crowds, and they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, thinking he was dead. Man, the opposition, the persecution is ramped up to a very high level here. They came into the city, they proclaimed, they were persecuted. But was God working? Did God do anything through that? At the end of this verse, we have Paul, he's dead. Pull him out of the city. And I don't know if you've ever seen or, or read about what it's like to stone somebody when somebody is stoned to death. It is a gruesome, brutal way to die. They pull him out. You can imagine Paul laying there, his body, Barnabas weeping over his missionary partner who's just been killed by this crowd. Did their message amount to anything? Did their sacrifice and the pain of persecution result in anybody coming to know Christ? Look what it says in verse 20. After the disciples gathered around him. Ah, there are disciples. There were people that came to know Christ as a result of their sacrifice. After the disciples gathered around him, and here we have the next instance of God working as well. He got up and went into the next town. I love this story so much because it just, to me, epitomizes the Apostle Paul. He's stoned. I believe he actually died here. He's on the ground, probably brutal wounds. They're standing around weeping for the loss of the Apostle Paul, and suddenly he stands up. I don't know about you, I might be a little freaked out. Right? This is kind of creepy. This is like the story of someone coming out of a casket at a funeral. Like, oh, what is going on here? He stands up. He doesn't miss a beat. He looks around at the people crying. And he's like, what are you guys crying about? Let's go on and preach to the next town. What a guy, right? He's on mission, going to preach to the next town. Dead, raised from the dead, and on to the next place. God was working. We prepare. We proclaim. We are persecuted. But God is working through it all. Verse 21 comes and they retrace their steps now and it tells us after they had preached the gospel in that town and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, to Iconium, to Antioch, strengthening the disciples by encouraging them in the faith and telling them. Here's how they were encouraging, friends. Look with me at verse 22. Here was their encouraging word to them. It is necessary to go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound very encouraging to me. But it was a word of encouragement. What is that word of encouragement? 
That word of encouragement is, friend, in the year 2020, you may be experiencing unprecedented things in your lives. You may be starting to feel culture closing in around us. You may be feeling opposition to God in His program. But the encouragement here from the text is this is normal. This is what we should be expecting. And I think there will be more of that. Even today, we ought to be praying for a church out in California, pastored by John MacArthur, who decided today that they're going to defy the governor's edict to not meet. Now, you can interpret that any way you want to. You can make your own decision whether he was right or wrong to do that. I'm just saying we should pray for them. They're, they're going to be in the hot seat. They're going to face this kind of opposition. And I think there's more coming. I don't think it's going to get easier to be a Christian in this country. I think it's going to get harder to be a Christian in this country. But friends, what we're seeing from Acts chapter 13 and 14 is that the more there's opposition, the more God is working. And that is encouraging to me. That is encouraging to my heart to know that when times are tough, when it's difficult to do ministry, that God has not forgotten us, God has not abandoned us, but that God is actually working. And they go back and they report to what has happened. They strengthened the churches. They organized churches. In verse 24, it says, They passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. After they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From there, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been commended by the grace of God for the work that they now completed. They came back to report to their home church. And what does it say in verse 27? How did they report to their home church? Verse 27 they came back and had their slideshow going, and they said, Look at all the amazing things that we did. Look how incredible we are as missionaries. I mean, you should be privileged to have us as your missionaries. I mean, we are studs. I know we don't look like it, but all this stuff happened, and we did it all. Is that what verse 27 says? I love verse 27 because it puts it in perspective and you can see why Paul and Barnabas were able to stay encouraged in the middle of the opposition because they had their eyes focused on Christ. Verse 27, after they arrived and gathered the church together, they reported everything that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they spent a considerable time with the disciples. Somewhere between chapter 14 and 15 or into chapter 15, the Apostle Paul writes the book of Galatians here, probably his first epistle that he wrote, just to give you some timeline. But here they are back in Antioch, reporting, resting, rejoicing in all that God's done. Probably being asked the question, Paul, was it worth it? Paul, was it worth it to be pelted by stones until you were dead? Paul, was it worth it to have the Jewish people oppose you at every turn and every town you went into? Was it worth it? And Paul says, yes, it was worth it. Why? Because to live the Christian life is this cycle. To live the Christian life in this culture looks like this. We prepare, we proclaim, we are persecuted, but friend, God works and God is working. But how easy it is to get our eyes off of that. And if you're sitting here today, you're feeling discouraged, you're feeling disconnected from your faith, you're feeling disconnected from your church, and and I've heard those things before. I've heard it in this time. I just don't feel connected. (sighs) Let me tell you why that's happening. Because you've gotten your eyes off the Lord Jesus Christ. You've forgotten why it is that we're doing this. You've forgotten the fact that when opposition comes, it doesn't mean that God's abandoned us. What it actually means is that God is working in a very special way. Now, I don't know how he's working. As we heard from our friends earlier, they're experiencing all these oppositions. And I I think to myself, why doesn't God just allow them to do what they're wanting to do? Why doesn't God just open the right doors? It doesn't make any sense for them to be stateside, especially with Dave being so technologically challenged, right, brother? (laughs) doesn't make any sense. God's working. I've asked God many times in the last couple of months, what are you doing? This makes no sense to me. And you know what? He owes me an answer, doesn't he? No. But I'm praying, and I'm holding out hope, and I know that at some point we'll see that amidst it all, 
And through it all, God was working. Just like Paul and Barnabas. At every turn, opposition, opposition, opposition. But what's the summary phrase of each of these stories? God was working. We prepare, we proclaim, we are persecuted, but God is still working. I just want you to take a moment, as you're sitting here today, grab a Connect card if you haven't done so already. On the back of that Connect card, you have an opportunity to write prayer requests and comments down. And I have a next step for you this morning, if you would be so kind to just think through this, and I think it helps in our minds to take Scripture and truth and put it into words and how it applies to us today. And on the back of that Connect card for next step today, I would like, I'd, I'd like you to write something down. I'd like you to write this. Amidst the difficulty, the uncertainty, the opposition, the difficulty that you've been facing in the last nine months or so, where can you trace the finger of God to say God is working? Where can you see that? Because if you don't see that, you're going to ask the question, is it worth it? And the answer is going to be no. If you're not watching for God's hand, it's not going to be worth it. If you're not seeing the centrality of Jesus in all of these things, it's not going to be worth it. It will be worth it, though. And we will be able to ask the question, is it worth it? We'll be able to say yes. Why? Because Jesus is worth it. And God is working.